Uh, I see a few new people. Who's new? Who's never been here before? Sweet. All right, so if you've never been here before, starting on the left side, introduce yourself. Yeah. One of you. Next new guy. Hi, my name is Dan. I have used the Pictability Logic Directives in Enterprise for a long time, more often so SQL only recently. I built uh, uh, my, my uh, demo at home using SQL. And it worked okay until recently when it uh, got corrupted. And by now, you can only expect it with, with the Steve Grant tables option. So I'm particularly interested to know if there is some other way. <laughs> <laughs> And we'll add them to the list. Right. Uh, new, other new people? Yeah. My name is Tadataka. I, I'm from Japan. I'm working in Santa Clara. Mm -hmm. So uh, we began to internet service using MySQL. And so we would like to know, know more about MySQL. Mm -hmm. So that's the third reason. All right. Anybody else new? Yeah, two more. Okay. My name is Ryan. I'm Project actually, I bug fixing or testing, I'm trying to look for tips on getting the chat. Alright, if anybody is involved with in the project. Not exactly a project per se, but yeah. <laughs> the software in itself, yeah. I, I do a fair bit of work on it. I don't know if anybody else does. Maybe I'm one. <laughs> Crying and. Crying and sleep alone. My name is Phantom Lee, and uh, I was introduced to MySQL a couple of years ago and uh, just enjoyed it. Uh, a couple of my friends just started using it, and I'm just here getting interested in performance. I'm um, trying to make it run faster. Um, All right. <coughs> Let's see. Let's do a couple of quick introductions. Everybody that is not new, uh, there are a bunch of you, but. Uh, just a quick introduction of who you are, at least your, your name nice and loud, and, and where you might be from, and what you do. I'm Alan Kassendorf from Six Apart. Good enough. Larry <laughs> Grunson from California. <laughs> <laughs> Keen observation, Larson. <laughs> oh, I'm Alan Everybody's names that probably printed. But. Rick James tells about John. Other. Go, I'm, Tim. I'm Tim K. I have a startup called Boopsy. And B O O P S I. That's not Boopsy. It's with a P. And you get something different at Boopsy. Uh, you should all uh, pull out your Blackberries or whatever you have, Windows Mobile, and point your uh, browser to Boopsy.com. Download our software. It's uh, very cool. <laughs> B O O P S I E. Is that an iPhone? Uh, yeah. Then you want Boopsy.mobi. Uh, M O B I. Yeah. 
Yeah. All right. Uh, I have two short Next. Dawn. He's the Dawn. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else? Go. Uh, look for a machine uh, park here. I've been to a couple of my siblings. Are you starting a French Legion in the U.S.? Hi, <laughs> my name is Ron Zach from Countlights.com. Ron Statistic Science. Other people? Who are you? He's not new. Yeah, I'm Andrew from Yahoo. Who are you? I am Jeremy. So I am your friendly host, Jeremy Cole. Uh, I run a company called Proven Scaling, along with Eric, who you sometimes see if you were here last month, you probably saw Eric instead of me. Um, but we basically do MySQL consulting for lots of companies, big and small, and uh, lots of interesting stuff, and host meetups, at least one meetup. <clears throat> so without further ado, questions. What are burning topics and questions? We had at least a couple already, but shoot. Uh, Facebook hinted that they use MySQL in a funny way, where they have only four tables, and then they use some of the tables to record the metadata. Anybody have an idea how that works? Anybody have an idea about how that works that's allowed to talk about it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Maybe RDF. Terribly, terribly inefficient. Facebook seems to the scale pretty well. Funny way. I could use the microphone. <laughs> then you might be able to hear me on the recording. OK. <clears throat> so um, Facebook, what exactly did you want to know about how they use MySQL? It's obviously they have some scheme that might be a standard sort of way of doing things. If anybody has any ideas on it. But it doesn't sound like we're going to get very far. <laughs> Shoot. All right. Next. How can you um, repair uh, the MySQL installation who only runs with a non skip run table? Okay, so how to repair an installation with broken grant tables, basically. Very good question. Other questions? I saw another hand. Yeah. Do you have particular data types in mind? Okay, so data types changing between versions. What's up with that? Gotcha. Other questions? Comparing the Python, Ruby, and the PHP, which one based on your experience was faster with MySQL? Oh, that's a loaded question. <laughs> so um, we could have some discussion. There might be more fighting than anything, but. Python, Ruby, PHP, Perl, et cetera. I think a lot of it's going <laughs> to. The fighting, yeah, the fighting begins already. Okay. Python, Ruby, what do you say? Python, Ruby, PHP, and what? Perl. And what do I say? Perl. 
and Java and <laughs> C. <laughs> okay, other questions? Am I the right person to give that? <laughs> and I guess you said five one. And we could even get MySQLs. They have some funny uh, icon thing for 6.0 with like oddly sized numbers in it. So. <clears throat> Okay, so how to promote a slave to a master? All right, I think we might better stop at eight questions. <laughs> we haven't even added any more from discussion yet. So um, I guess we could just start from the top. Does anyone want to say anything about Facebook and MySQL? I don't, I don't know exactly what you're meaning when you say they have four tables and they use it in an odd way. That way they can, uh, they can add new fields to things without having to change my speech. You might be suffering from a certain feature of dealing with companies where one person told you something that is specific to their part of what they do at Facebook. Well, okay, that's not the impression I got. Based on what I know already, that doesn't sound right. <laughs> I don't know how much I can elaborate on that. <laughs> yeah. I don't know a thing about Facebook. I've never been on it. But from what you're saying, I think I've used the technique before where you'll use your Facebook account and you'll add a tag and you'll say, like, add this to the account. Yeah. And that's how they add the tags to the account. Yeah. And then you can add the tags to the account. Yeah. And then you can use something that's like a tag, a tag ID. Some bit of metadata attached to that. Yeah. You just put on one table full of that stuff. You end up with a whole lot of that, and I mean, I guess there'd be scaling issues with all with all that. So. Yeah. But yeah. it works on on a small scale really well. Yeah. 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 Y
given the time zone of your machine and any time zone setting you've set in MySQL. Date time is a bit different. Date time is just date time. It doesn't have any related time zone information and it's not down converted to UTC or anything. So it just stores what you give it. Um, Timestamp, like you said, is a special case and there's some weird conversions that happen here and there. There's also um, a bit of a change and I guess it was four to four one um, on how, what format the timestamp field used, uh, which broke a lot of things and there was, I don't know, I don't know if there were any changes on, well, I guess the, the other change would be that you can use the on, the default current time, I think is the syntax for it, uh, syntax so that you don't have to have only the first timestamp field be automatically updated. You can have the third one instead, but it can still only be one. Uh, so the timestamp has a bit of special behavior that the first timestamp field in a table is automatically updated whenever that row is updated. So uh, if you don't explicitly set it, yeah, it's, well, it's all very confusing and I wouldn't necessarily recommend using it for a lot of things. But um, the idea being that, uh, sorry? Really, that's the only case is when you actually want that behavior of it being automatically updated. So you want a modification date for a row. Correct, and there's some unfortunate things around. People use it because it's smaller. It's four bytes instead of eight bytes. Date time is eight bytes. And people use timestamp because it's smaller and it's more compact, and, and then they don't realize the extra implications that it has, that it gets automatically updated and uh, it's converted to, to UTC, or at least it, it tries to convert it to UTC. Uh, although it, if, it doesn't, if the system doesn't have a proper representation of the time zone, it will likely store the wrong time. Uh, but um, in reality, if you just generally want to store a date and a time in the past, in the future, or whatever, uh, date time is the field type you should use. Timestamp is a special case for specifically storing modification time primarily. Uh, a lot of people sort of eschew the, uh, the, con the confines of the timestamp type and just use int and store a Unix timestamp and an int. That works just fine as well. Uh, and it allows you to personally deal with the time zone conversion issues and everything else and just have it store what you store or what you give it and, and give it back whatever you gave it later. So, Questions about timestamps, columns, date times, anything, anything come up? Is, it, is everyone equally confused now? Well, what changed between the versions? There's been a few changes, some of them half-baked. Um, the biggest and most annoying thing actually was that the format of the timestamp column, the output of it changed from 4.0 to 4.1. The standard date time format looks like, uh, it's a string actually, and it looks like you know, 2007-10-09 space, uh, you know, 13.37.07. So that's been the format of date time basically forever. Um, previous, to 4.1, so in 4.0 and all older versions, the format of timestamp was the same thing minus all of the punctuation. So it's just a concatenated string of 2007, 10, 09, et cetera. Um, in 4.1, they changed it to use that format instead, which broke a lot of people's parsers for the timestamp output because they had parsed it in Perl with a simple regular expression and then now it breaks. Um, and actually, that was a big thing at Yahoo, I guess. We patched MySQL to allow you to turn the old format back on. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, that's probably, uh, that's probably the biggest one that people encountered. So, um, And you can still get the old output back through some calls to date format and such, but it still means you have to change your application and you probably break things. So. Um, other questions, timestamps, date times? No. So actually, I mentioned half-baked stuff. One of the things that was changed in, I guess it went, went in 4.1. No, maybe it was in 5.0. I don't remember. I have to look it up exactly which major version it went in. But the, maybe someone else knows, actually. The micro time stuff that is really broken. Basically, MySQL outputs timestamps with seconds and microseconds, but it doesn't have the ability to store microseconds, and it doesn't have the ability to query the current time in microseconds, so it's pretty pointless, actually. 
Yeah, I'm pretty, you, you can do arithmetic with it, but that's about it. <clears throat> okay. I just got it. done. Yeah, which was the other one? That was this one, huh? All right. Cracking through these. Repairing installations with broken grant tables. That actually is not that hard. Um, let me see. Switch to using this one. Maybe. So MySQL has an option called dash dash skip grants tables that allows you to start it without looking at the permissions tables. Um, those tables are. Mm -hmm. There's a directory called or a directory slash database called MySQL in the MySQL like in the default installation, and that has a bunch of tables in it. And this is a 5.0 release, so it has I guess, 17 tables now. Um, and those basically primarily store permissions, but also lots of other uh, things that MySQL needs to keep state on between restarts. So uh, stored functions, stored procedures, all kinds of things get stuffed into that database. If the database is broken for any reason, um, a very easy way to break it is converting them to InnoDB. Uh, that will break things pretty severely. Uh, then MySQL will refuse to start uh, because it needs those tables to initialize itself on boot. Uh, and actually, the changing it to InnoDB is an easy way to break it because at the time that it's trying to read them, InnoDB itself has not been started yet. So <laughs> it fails starting up. So it's a little tricky situation. Um, but what you can do to fix that, uh, if you have broken them in some way, and we could actually break mine if we want. This is good fun because you can actually change them. Oh, they fixed it. That's fairly sad. Well, you used to be able to change them while the server was running, and then you just couldn't restart. But I guess they've fixed that. Or, yeah, we can drop. Let's drop just one of them. This is just my laptop, so I don't really care. And uh, unfortunately, I can't really show it starting and stopping very easily. But uh, there's a nice little system preference on Mac OS X for MySQL. So if we shut it down now, type my password. In theory, it won't start back up. We'll see what happens. All right. And it's likely to fail. Doesn't provide much feedback, though. There we go. So we've broken it. <laughs> so the error message is reporting, and this is one that you would see if you break them generally, some variation of this fatal error, can't open and lock privilege tables, table doesn't exist, or table is corrupted, or table whatever. It does say NODB was already started. Uh, that's somewhat true. I think it started, but it's not ready to actually act at that point. So nonetheless, it doesn't work. <laughs> That may change in the future, but I don't know. Storage engines may also get the ability to store things in there in the future, which could further complicate matters. <laughs> um, so what can we do to fix it? Uh, basically, you can get MySQL to start uh, without trying to read the privilege tables by adding the skip grant tables option. So if we just go and 
add it to the config file. I don't have much in here, but script skip grant tables. I should be able to get it to start. So are you now on our network and we could come and mess with your tables? Ah, you could have anyway. And actually we check the log and it says ready for connection, so it actually did succeed in starting up. At this point, it doesn't have the concept of users, so anybody can log in with any username from any host and access anything they want. So how do we fix that? now? So it's back up now and we can access the data, but it's not really in a usable state because uh, we kind of need users in most production systems. So um, what you can do to fix that then At this point, the MySQL database is, is just like any other database. So if you do show databases, it may not actually allow you to rename them or anything, but you should be able to at this point drop oops, database MySQL. Okay, drop the other 16 tables. If you needed the data from those tables, you could actually uh, MySQL dump them and then restore the data from them later after you get the rest of the tables back or after you get you know, the uh, tables in an uncorrupted state uh, if you just need to repair them, you could also repair them since mine weren't corrupted. I just need to get them back. And actually, this is always going. This is always a, a workable solution. Basically, just get rid of what you have, start over. You can always recreate users. You haven't lost any data, so uh, recreating users is, e is easy. Um, so create database MySQL will give us back an empty MySQL database. Uh, Grant wouldn't do that uh, no. Actually, at this point, grant is disabled because the tables don't exist. So, yeah. And we can actually enable it on the fly, which I can show in a moment. But uh, there's a table called MySQL install DB. It's not in my path. Oh, come on. Yeah, I think it's in scripts. Ah, it's the only thing in scripts, too. This script basically um, installs the default databases. Um, so it would create a test database if that didn't exist, and it will. The primary function of what we wanted to do is to create the MySQL database. And, uh, oh, Jesus. <laughs> I may have to shut the other one down. Oh, that seemed to work. It's creating what was created before, or it's creating the some default uh, schema? It creates the default empty schema. It actually doesn't. There's a separate script that fills the timestamp time stamp tables if you want them to be filled. You may not. And there's also a separate one that fills the help tables. They don't get filled by default either. Um, so basically, the, the MySQL install DB script, once you've cleaned things up, you can use that uh, to recreate them in their default state, which is uh, basically a root user and an anonymous user. And life sucks sometimes. I did this as root, which is probably a bad idea. So. Ignore my fixing of things. Hey, it works. So that's sort of the gist of it. Does that make sense? Basically, MySQL install DB, you can poke around at it, and it, it's what you can use to recreate the default tables. If you have a working MySQL instance, you could also export those. So you could actually do a MySQL dump from one MySQL instance and load that into the MySQL database on the others while it's running with skip grant. Because while it's running with skip grant, it doesn't really care what you do to the MySQL database. It, it's not using it. So, yeah. Or you could use my mirror utility to <laughs> just do it live. Copy Potentially, yes. Like a copy commit. So actually, that was the other question, was now it's up and running. It still doesn't have a concept of users, because um, it's still running in skip grant mode. 
Uh, I don't actually have to restart it to get them to, to start using users again. So you can actually do fr flush privileges if you can spell privileges. That will start using the grants tables. So at that point, it has opened and read the grants tables. And provided they were working, uh, you now have users again. What and you can use grant commands. At this point? Probably an error. Error 127 so or so. You fix it, is what mm, yeah, sort of. And it wouldn't be a bad idea then to remove the skip grant tables. So the next time you restart MySQL, it doesn't come up with no users. All right, questions? Any more questions from that? A little live laptop demonstration. I could have logged into a production server somewhere and fixed it. Yeah. Caused it not to be available? Yeah, because of OK. So what MySQL does is it automatically converts to a security name to MySQL. Not exactly. If you, so you're saying if you restart MySQL and NODB is not available, then it will, any new tables you create will be converted to MySQL automatically, which is really annoying, actually. Um, but it doesn't convert the existing tables you have. It, it logically can't convert them because it can't read the data from them. So whenever it tries to open a table for a storage engine that it doesn't support, you'll get an error saying, I don't remember the error actually, so unknown storage engine number whatever, I think because a storage engine is a constant that's compiled in the number for the storage engine. So, so if, you, if you don't have NODB available on startup at any time, you just can't read NODB tables. If you try to create a new table, engine equals NODB, it will create it as the default engine type. After you have started it with NODB, or? Yeah, I mean, I realized that NODB was not available, but I realized after 10 days, NODB okay. was not available. Okay. So I, say, I see this table like mass and table, which I don't want, so I'm going to reconvert it back by making things available. Yeah. So at that point, if you were error, so that NODB thing is correct. This sounds like a specific case that we might have to chat about. I don't think uh, you shouldn't encounter errors like that, but it, it probably is too specific to, to address generally. So. Uh, so actually, that's another question from me that comes for you. Um, anyone know the name of something you can do to keep that from happening so that if you start, if you try to create a table using NODB and you don't have NODB available, that it will error instead of creating it as a MyISM table? Correct. There you go. No automatic engine conversion. That's actually in the SQL mode. Yeah. All right. Perfect. Done. Questions about biggest MySQL installations. How do you define biggest? How many millions? <laughs> Trillions? <laughs> um, I, I don't know. Other, others can pipe in on bigger ones that they've seen or big ones that they've seen. I think mine, I don't know. I, I have varying opinions of bigness, depending on what the application is doing. But um, just number of rows wise, well into the billions in a single table, and many, many billions in a single installation, many terabytes. How long it, took for a query? Yeah, it doesn't really affect query time. Ta table size doesn't affect query time at all, uh, provided what, what it really affects is the larger the data is 
compared to how much memory you have, the more likely it is that something is not in memory. Uh, but if your working set is 5 gig and you have you know, 18 terabytes of data, it doesn't matter that you have 18 terabytes of data because the 5 gig of data you care about still fits in, in memory. So it doesn't affect query time at all, the fact that the tables are really, really large. It does affect things like repair time. <laughs> yeah, if you want to alter that table, it's not going to be fun. If, if it's a MyISM table and, it, and you need to do a MyISM check because it got corrupted, good luck to that. I don't, I don't envy you. Is it? Yeah. yeah, relatively. I mean, it depends on the size of the range. So if you're if you're pulling a range with half a billion records in it, it's not going to scale very well. <laughs> and it's going to, in fact, in that, that's actually one area where MySQL is weaker than, for instance, Oracle. That if you're trying to specifically scan lots of data, uh, MySQL is not very strong at that. It's pretty slow, actually. It's a pretty naive implementation and pretty basic implementation of nested loop joins, and that's the only option it has. And in addition to that, the storage engine interface that everyone loves so much actually imposes a pretty crazy amount of overhead for things like nested loop joins um, and for complex group buys and such, because all of these rows have to be basically converted from one storage format to another to be worked on in memory and then potentially written out to a different storage format to be stored in a temporary table and then pulled back out of that temporary table and it, it all gets really messy. Um, storage engine concept is, is nice. Um, as far as performance goes, maybe it's a little overrated. So the it hurts you. Is what, something that Oracle would do? Or? Well, things like Oracle, Postgres, those don't really have a storage engine concept. So they, they don't have as much baggage as far as dealing with uh, you know, really tight loops is one of the areas where it hurts you. One of the other areas where it hurts MySQL is replication that the format that it has to replicate things in is completely different than the format it uses internally to store things. So you have duplication of things like NODB's logs that are perfectly good logs are unusable for replication. So we have to have another log running at the same time and they can't be synced together and it all gets very complicated. But, uh, but the original question was biggest MySQL. Sort of. Let's add that as a subpoint. Let's come back to that in a moment. Okay. Uh, at the last MySQL conference, there was a talk on data warehousing. The lecturer came from American Airlines, and he, he had a 15 terabyte database. Pretty decent size. Was that Sabre or American? I think it was American. Hmm. Interesting. Sorry? Sort of. Sort of. Their, their ticket, basically their, their fair searches run on MySQL. The, the authoritative source of the data for Sabre is not MySQL, but the ticket searches are actually MySQL. Yeah, at last count, I think 250 MySQL servers running fair combinations. So you won't necessarily get sure. the, the absolute best fair, but you get a close <laughs> What are you trying to say? <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it, I mean, it's just scaling reads, basically. If you try to scale a big mainframe system up to do that many reads to deal with Travelocity and Yahoo Travel and all of the Sabre terminals and everything else, it's, it gets expensive, so... So partitioning was on that part. Uh, what does MySQL do? What are the other options, basically, for dealing with large data sets? Uh, so one of the areas where MySQL is weak, and, and it's, it's good being not a MySQL employee, because I can talk about all the areas where MySQL is weak. Um, <clears throat> but one of the big areas is in lack of parallel query and lack, to some extent, of uh, partitioning support. So MySQL 5.1 has partitioning support. It isn't really complete yet. Uh, it's fairly new, and uh, it's not really 
very well tested in production. There are a few users of it in production. There are a few pretty big installations of it, but there's still you know, a handful of installations compared to the total number of MySQL installations. Uh, so it's not really mature yet as a feature. Um, but basically what that allows you to do is take one table and split it into lots of chunks uh, and allow you to manipulate those chunks individually. So you can imagine a simple implementation of partitioning. Partitioning basically goes in two forms. Well, in three forms, really. But range-based partitioning, list-based partitioning, and hash-based partitioning. In hash-based partitioning, you don't really decide which chunks get formed. You just say, divide this into 64 chunks, and it does it for you. Uh, in range-based partitioning, you could say, for instance, um, well, there's a number of ways to approach that. But you could say, um, you know, everything older than 1995 goes in one table, you know, 96 through 98 go in another table, 99 through 2003 go in another table. You can divide it arbitrarily into as many different ranges as you want. And the last one is list-based partitioning, which is uh, where you, based on constants, choose a particular table for a particular row based on some calculation from that row. So uh, typically that would be to create uh, you know, a table per day, for instance, uh, or a table per first letter of name, you know, whatever number of different things, per first two characters of a hash. You can decide however you want to, to partition that out. Uh, they all have their advantages and disadvantages. But the basic idea is it splits the data into lots of subtables, basically. And then in theory, those subtables can be manipulated individually. Um, so there's a, there's a couple of reasons that it's interesting. One of them is in uh, collecting data sort of over time. So let's say you're you know, building a logging type system where you're collecting you know, 30 million rows a day or a billion rows a day or however many rows you want to throw in the system a day. Uh, and you want to keep 30 days worth of data. The problem comes around, that perfectly works perfectly well, and you get this really big table until you go to delete the 31st day worth of data. And that causes all kinds of locking issues and takes a really long time and causes sort of vacuumy issues in the database where it has to reclaim that space. Um, and it's just overall ugly <laughs> uh, because you don't care about the data, obviously. You just want to get rid of it as quickly as possible. So deleting each row in a whole transactional manner and keeping things consistent and everything is really not on the top of your priority list. So. <clears throat> Pretty much, yeah, garbage collection. So uh, the solution then in partitioning is to partition them by day. And then uh, every day at midnight, for instance, you can drop the 31st partition and create the new one. So you basically swap them out. You can drop the old partition and create a new partition. Um, and the, sort of the magic happens. And in theory, provided that the underlying storage engine is able to get rid of an entire table very quickly, which for InnoDB means that you're using InnoDB file per table. Uh, so it creates a file. All it has to do is delete the file, and the data is gone. Uh, and the OS is sort of responsible for reclaiming that space, and it is much faster than MySQL is internally. Um, so that's pretty interesting for collecting data over time and, and being able to get rid of old data easily. One of the other ways where partitioning is usually interesting is in being able to uh, query very large data sets efficiently. And this is an area where MySQL is currently lacking. Um, but this comes in two areas. One is partition pruning, so the ability for MySQL to, or the database, whatever, it doesn't have to be MySQL, to look at a query and say, this only needs to touch partitions 1, 7, and 9, and not bother with touching any of the others. So that's partition pruning. And that goes a long way to making lots of queries faster. Uh, another area where it's interesting is in parallel query, which MySQL does not currently support any form of, uh, which is the ability that Oracle has to scan multiple partitions simultaneously and then combine the results together. Since we know the data that exists in each partition, after we've pruned them, we can then scan them in parallel combine the results and give you one result back uh, in one nth of the time it would have taken if we scanned them serially. Currently, MySQL only scans them serially. Um, eventually, in theory, since partitioning makes it easier to implement parallel query, um, eventually MySQL will get it. I don't know if it's on the roadmap now or where it is on the roadmap, but uh, in theory, it will happen sometime. Questions, partitioning concepts? Yeah. Correct. 
you know, there's about a lot of terms for that. Well, the federated in, in, this, in the sense of the federated storage engine. Yeah, that's a whole can of worms. The, so there's another concept, the federated storage engine, which is a separate storage engine that allows you to access tables on a remote server. Um, it's pretty much half-baked, uh, and it works, but I wouldn't necessarily recommend it for production systems. So. <clears throat> In theory, in the future, you could have partitioning combined with federation, where some of the partitions live on other servers, and that won't do you a whole lot of good unless you have parallel query. But <laughs> nonetheless, yeah. What do you know about clustering and flexible clustering Add that to the list. Oh, blue screens. <clears throat> So I think the answers for biggest MySQL, pretty big, billions of rows easily, terabytes of data. Really depends on your use. You can also, I mean, you can build a five terabyte database and perform very quickly and do what you need to do. And you can also build you know, a 100 meg database that performs incredibly poorly. So <laughs> it depends a lot on optimization and, and design. Um, the holy war. Anyone want to comment on any of those? <laughs> they are great. Yeah. I just want to know why everybody hates Perl so much. <laughs> <laughs> they just don't understand. Oh, no, I mean, there, there you go. He says Perl sucks. Can we get some detail on the stuff of this? I think, I, think, I think the key in that particular discussion is that uh, random sysadmins and, and other folks tend to get per random Perl code foisted upon them. <laughs> so a lot of them have hatred for Perl because that's the only thing they've had thrown at them that they have to maintain. So. Well, another way to put it is Perl is much better at letting a bad programmer make a complete mess than otherwise. <laughs> I don't know. I've seen some pretty bad PHPs. <laughs> I think an easy answer to that is that they all actually use the same underlying C API. There's a couple of wrappers. There's a, I mean, there's a couple of components that don't use that, but for the most part, they all use the C API. So they all have pretty similar performance characteristics. Um, and there isn't really a lot that you can do in any of them that you couldn't do in the other with regards to MySQL specifically. Um, there are, there's, for instance, a pure PHP MySQL connector. There's a pure Perl one. I don't know about Ruby and Python. There might be, but I haven't heard of it. Um, at this point, if you're looking for the best performance out of the MySQL API, the only places you can go are the C API and the Java API. They're both native, and they're both pretty darn efficient. Um, all of these are just wrappers on top of the C API, so they're gonna, all going to add their own performance implications. Particularly, like the PHP API is for you know very large result sets and such, not necessarily <laughs> going to be all that efficient. Um, yeah, Perl does a lot of internal allocations and such, but yeah. The MySQL I one or MySQL ND? Jeez, there's so many of them. Yeah, it's a native, yeah. It's like 40% faster. Yeah, so there's a new project called MySQL ND that's MySQL native driver. Um, and there, this is the second new MySQL <laughs> driver for PHP. Um, they created the MySQL I project, which replaced my, the MySQL, x slash MySQL extension for PHP, which uh, basically just added support for the 4.1 protocol and stored, not stored procedures, uh, prepared statements. Um, and the binary protocol stuff in 4.1. Uh, and then now the MySQL ND project because MySQL I is kind of a pig <laughs> and is pretty slow. Are so. we talking about a factor of five difference? Because these uh, are no, it's like, uh, he was saying, yeah, 40 percent ish, so something like that. It's not worth making decisions based on that factor. 
Not unless you're really struggling for hardware. Assuming that your performance is primarily dominated by transferring result sets from MySQL. <laughs> The new loving carrying MySQL driver. <laughs> All right, uh, let's skip the future talk and talk about current stuff for a moment, and we'll come back to that. Um, how to promote a slave to a master? That's a bigger question, probably, depending a lot on how you've set up replication. But um, how much do you want to know? <laughs> I think the the basis of it is sort of provided the two machines are, have identical data on them, and you can do something to guarantee that that's the case. Usually that means some sort of downtime, and that just the basic case, provided you haven't planned to do this beforehand, um, you stop input to the master, and once they're identical, so once the slave is completely caught up, all you have to do is change the configurations around, and it's that easy. It's just a matter of running a change master command, basically. Um, in the Real world, you probably have something more complex like dual master or ring replication or master with couple slaves or some other more complex configuration that you couldn't really say specifically how to move a slave to become a master. Um, my favorite option is probably the thing that I could say. My favorite option is dual master replication, right to only one at a time. That allows you to easily move back and forth between the two using IP takeover. So you have a shared IP that you move between the two machines, and it's really easy to move a slave to a master, a master to a slave, because you don't have to change the MySQL configuration or resync anything. All you have to do is change uh, basically which server and IP points to, and, and that's as, at least basically as easy as it is. So what's the, what's the Sorry? With our failover scripts, maybe a second? sort of soft downtime. The servers aren't really down, but they're dropping connections, basically. So. And you said before you like to do that manually instead of automatically? Trigger it manually, yes. Yeah. You can, you can automatically fail over, but that's uh, asking for trouble. Yeah. Also have bin log turned on on your slave before you start yeah, it would be a good idea to uh, have bin logs turned on, and in fact, to have the log slave updates option turned on, and basically the slave configured as a master would be before you attempt any sort of failover. Other questions? Yeah. Reset slave? It should. Yeah, it should get rid of everything related to the slave. Reset slave? Reset slave deletes the relay logs and the master.info. Reset master resets the, ma the binary logs on the master. But I think you mean, they're somewhat confusingly named because you're trying to change the master of a slave and you run reset slave rather than reset master. So. He probably ran reset master instead. But reset slave should do what you want. It basically it gets rid of relay logs and makes the slave not a slave anymore. If you have dual master setup, you know you don't need it. If you have uh, just pure master slave, uh, then you may want to sort of make them. This, in the same configuration that they were before, but on different machines, and meaning that one is a master and one is only a slave. But yeah, it's not strictly necessary. So in a dual master setup, you have two machines that are both replicating to and from each other. So you never have to change either of the configurations. You just change you know, your clients up here. You just change what they point to. So they only write to one at a time. Well, it's 
automatically in the sense that there's a script that that scripts the whole thing. No, no. The clients all get their connections dropped. So if they can handle a dropped connection and reconnecting, then they don't have to. You don't have to write any client code. So and they should be able to handle that anyway, because that could happen at any time. So. Okay. And this we've we've talked about replication a few times, but that's just sort of a more replication topic. That's a much bigger. And, and relies on having a lot of previous knowledge of how replication works. So it's not a very good general topic. Yeah. Uh, I think I know what you're asking, and probably no. <laughs> the, the slave file names and positions are not portable to any other machine which is actually a big flaw in replication. <laughs> so there's no way to know if you have a, if you have like, uh, three machines like this, and you want to move C to be connected to A instead of B, there's no good way to do that. I mean, you, you can do it, but it's, it's kind of ugly. Either you, you take some downtime to stop the whole thing and make sure that they're all in sync, or you reclone this one. So if you have a recent backup of B, you can use that to set up C to replicate from A. So you can do a lot of things to make it work, but they're all ugly. There's no, what, there's no way to say, I'm at position 42 replicating from B, so what should I be replicating from A? Uh, the, the real answer to that is that MySQL replication should have originally been based on uh, globally unique transaction identifiers, but instead it was based on file names and positions. And the file names and positions are not a very good way to denote where you are in replication. Not the least of which because they're always um, sort of ascending rather than being able to be mixed because transactions don't necessarily have to be executed in order, uh, but the files sort of do have to be processed in order just based on how the, the protocol works. Correct. Yeah. But yeah, it's, it still means that you have uh, some downtime basically to quiet the machines, quiet them. Cluster. Anyone using cluster? Anyone thought about using cluster? Anyone given up on using cluster? <laughs> why? Why give up and why use it? Well, both. Why you it? Well, I can answer these, but you know, <laughs> why? But why? Why? Yeah. <laughs> sort of. You can fail over pretty fast without clustering, though. I've actually never seen clustering used for that because the latency is too high. Yeah. So there's a, a couple of things here. Basically, what clustering means in the general sense, well, it means a lot of things, but what usually is meant by cluster when you talk about database, if you're not talking about clustered indexes, is you have the ability to have n number of machines that communicate amongst each other in every possible way. Um, they all know how to contact each other, and they share a lot of state. So any client that's accessing them over here just pretends that it's one big machine, basically. They just connect to the cluster, and you know they're basically handled. MySQL cluster is a little bit different in that regard that the client for MySQL cluster in most cases is actually a MySQL server. So your client is a client of MySQL. MySQL is a client of cluster. So you lose some of the benefits of cluster itself in, in that sort of session portability concept and, and such. So 
Um, in most clustering implementations, sessions are managed by the cluster itself, so you never have to reconnect. Your, your session is transferred automatically from one node to another if a node fails, and there's all kinds of stuff around that. MySQL cluster, not so much. So in MySQL cluster, you have, you know, these clients are actually uh, SQL nodes, which you can have any number of which connect to the cluster. And then your end clients out here connect using the regular MySQL protocol to any number of the SQL nodes to talk to the cluster. So they uh, usually uh, load balancer, hardware load balancer would be sufficient. Or just a round robin if you really wanted to. <clears throat> um, but the downsides of cluster, anyone? Yeah. I think actually all of the above that you just said. <laughs> the only thing that doesn't probably is upgrading. It could do a rolling upgrade of the software on the cluster. But you can. But adding a new cluster node, I don't think so. So that, that would imply rehashing the data. And yeah, I don't think that happens online. Well, sort of. You remove it, but the cluster is degraded. so. Basically, I guess it, uh, in the default state, it doesn't really move anything around as far as I know. It just redirects requests for data. So they all have to go to the secondaries rather than primaries. But um, I'm by far not a cluster expert, so take anything I say with a grain of salt. But, uh, the big downsides right now, actually, in MySQL 5.0 is that cluster is entirely in memory. Uh, so you, all of your data has to fit in memory at least twice plus overhead. Uh, so of your cluster nodes, you need to have enough memory to hold all of your data at least twice. Um, and there's no other option, basically. So if you have a large enough data set, cluster just isn't an option. And that's usually what I've run into with most companies is that at least over time, maybe they can start out using cluster, but over time, if they run the numbers for it, it's just not scalable, uh, that they can't keep adding memory to the cluster at a fast enough rate. Thirty-two. Yeah, thirty-two minus overhead, which likely gives you more like twenty-five. But then, what's the point of cluster? You can get pretty good performance. So, very high availability and uh, high performance. So, provided that you know the primary key of everything you want. Yeah. If you don't, if if you try to do joins across a cluster, eh, not so much performance. Again, back to the whole nested loop join concept being not very efficient and fetching things from the storage engine and. It's not going to be very fast. Basically means that each row fetch turns into a network round trip um, within cluster itself, so within the storage engine, H-A-N-D-B, -H anyway. Uh, other questions? Anybody? Yeah. Yeah. So cluster is, is an in-memory database. So all of your data has to fit in memory on the cluster, not on each node, but on the cluster overall. So each row is distributed to at least two nodes by default. Well, it's distributed to two nodes by default. You can adjust that and make it three or four, which changes your overhead numbers. But the default is two nodes, which means the data has to fit on the overall cluster twice. So if you have 64 gig of RAM across the whole cluster, at maximum, you could only dream to hold 32 gig of data. In reality, with all of the overhead involved, um, you're going to hold a, quite a bit less than that. So. Which is OK for quite a lot of applications if they have very small, very high rate of change data, um, such as telecom applications, which is what it was originally designed for, where they have mapping tables, basically that are fairly large, large enough that you wouldn't want to put them in memory on one machine, and you wouldn't want to deal with the uh, HA situation of having them in memory on one machine, uh, but, but small enough that they still are sort of, it's viable to keep them in memory. Aren't there special purpose databases specifically for that application as well? That is NDB, <laughs> created by Ericsson, exactly for that purpose. So it sounds like there's almost no niche left for 
Actually, one of the interesting niches is sessions. Sessions are very much like the telecom application that it was originally designed for, which is their very high rate of change, fairly small amounts of data, um, and potentially lots of them. Uh, so on a busy enough website, you know, if you were to imagine today, let's say, let's create a session database for all of Yahoo. Cluster might not be a bad option, but you'd have to evaluate it, I guess. And I don't know that Yahoo even has a session database. But <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> Cookies. Given the setting, if you were to create a session database for all of Google. OK. Ah, blue. Before you change topics, yep. can I back up and ask? Back up all you want. You could ask that. <laughs> we could kick you out. <laughs> Yeah, that's a good question, actually. Merge tables are a horrible abomination, which was interesting at one time, but is no longer useful. OK, so forget that and just move on. Yeah, so basically, merge tables were created because views and partitioning didn't exist. Um, and views or partitioning are interesting for different purposes that merge tables were useful for, but they were primarily useful for that removing the 31st day of data scenario. They only work with my ISEM, and overall, they're pretty ugly. Like, so, so partitioning yeah, yeah, and it hasn't always been like in in especially a lot of the alpha versions of five one partitioning was really rough and it didn't do all of what merge tables did. I think at this point it now is a complete replacement and better actually because it does. If you specifically need that functionality, yes. If you don't, don't use five one. If you need it, then absolutely. So basically, the sorry, go ahead. No, no, no. It's all, it's worse than that. Uh, 5.1 is going to be the next major release of MySQL. It hasn't been officially released yet. It's currently marked RC, which is sort of premature in my opinion. But nonetheless, um, eventually it will become GA, and then they'll sort of encourage everyone to start using it. And that eventuality is supposed to happen in the next six months or so. Um, whether I would recommend to start putting it in production immediately after it's marked GA, probably not. Um, it needs a lot more eyes before. Yeah, something like that. Unless you specifically need partitioning for you know, one part of your application or for one application or whatever. If you need partitioning, absolutely start using it because there is no real alternative to it. No, it's mostly just performance problems and, and weird quirks of not implemented features and such. So if it works for you, it's going to continue to Yeah. Yeah, actually, the biggest problem right now, I think, with partitioning is if you massively partition a table. So you've got like two, 3,000 partitions of one table, uh, which is not unheard of if you have daily partitions for a couple of years. Um, Anytime an open request comes in for a partition table, it actually opens all of the partitions. It doesn't, it, so basically it does the partition pruning after opening rather than before. <laughs> um, and that's an architectural problem right now that they've promised to fix, but I haven't seen it fixed yet, so we'll see. That also means that you can get interesting errors if you don't have enough open tables allowed, for instance. Like the, the, uh, table cache number just goes sky high if you want to use partitioning because you have five clients that need to use a table with 2,000 partitions. You need 10,000 tables open for those five clients. And anytime you open one of those, it's really expensive. So the table cache actually needs to be working because if, if they get closed, then it hurts. All right. And if you ever run partitioning in debug mode with lots of partitions, God help you. Because those opening requests uh, take a lot of time in debug mode. <laughs> so opening a table, I think a test table had like three or 400 partitions. And opening it took like 15 seconds in debug mode. <laughs> Maybe there's a little too much debugging going on. But All right. Uh, future stuff, MySQL 5, 5, 1, 6, et cetera. What do you want to know? <laughs> Who suggested that question, actually? What do you want to know? Uh, well, you just I mentioned a couple of things already. I cheated, but. Correct. Sorry? 
5.0 is the current GA release, despite Yahoo's lack of acceptance. <laughs> yes. So, and, and that's sort of actually my fault to some extent, but on purpose. Um, but Yahoo's a pretty big environment. So uh, f at the time that 5.0 was being touted as what should be the GA release, it was nowhere near stable enough to be deployed across all of the servers at Yahoo, nor at Google. In fact, Google only started the move to 5.0 a couple of months ago. So, um, Is there something they need that they bothered upgrading? Google? Or Yahoo? Why, why not just stay with what they're, what's working for them? Uh, well, a number of reasons, I guess. But they need the ability to have people care about their support issues, I guess. <laughs> So that's probably the biggest feature of <laughs> upgrading at that point. Well, it's it's more a matter that you it, it's the sort of how many eyes you have looking at something problem that if there's a performance issue you find at this point in MySQL 323, you can fix it, but you're going to be the only one using it. So if you keep with a at least somewhat current version. You can sort of publish that, and people will use it, and MySQL might accept it, and they might say, oh, yeah, that sounds like a bug, instead of, go away. We don't support 3.23 anymore. <laughs> so, yeah. And there are some new things in 5.0 that are nice, um, none of which include stored procedures or triggers or anything. But um, the, the nice things are mostly around NODB performance and uh, monitoring. Like all of the show status variables that are new for 5.0 are one of the biggest reasons, actually. Uh, one, another one is, um, so actually, uh, part of the answer to that, um, which I can say, being not a Googler, but have, Google having published all of their research on said, said topics, uh, it's all public information at this point, um, is there's a lot of these problems with 4.1 that Google has already fixed in their patches to 4.1, sorry, to 4.0. Um, so they don't necessarily have to move because of that feature, but to get the official version of that feature, they have to move. Um, so one of those is one of the more important ones for um, sort of integrity and replication and such um, is the ability to do a flush tables with read lock and get a consistent snapshot of the database uh, because in 4.0 and 4.1, flush tables with read lock does not block commit. So if something is already has an in-progress transaction, they'll continue writing to the database, and you will never get a consistent snapshot. So in 5.0, flush tables with read lock, you get a consistent. Everything is blocked. If you have the ability to snapshot the file system, you can do it. So pretty handy. Uh, Code.google.com. There's a MySQL patches. Pretty much just the patches and, and talking to the right people, I guess. I don't know that there's any papers on it. They're not exactly the type that write papers, I guess. <laughs> it's, it's been a stretch to get them to document exactly what's in the patch. But. Uh, so I guess the questions, the, the answers there, currently 5.0 is the suggested release. And actually, as proven scaling and as a sort of general MySQL person, I would say 5.0 is probably the place to be right now. Um, 4.1 is getting a little more painful because of those things like lack of flush tables with read lock. One of the biggest reasons that, uh, that 4.1 sucks is this one. Let's see. So. All of these wonderful new variables in show status give you a lot more insight into exactly what NODB is doing. So if you're dependent on NODB, you really want these, uh, particularly if you're dependent on NODB and you want to actually monitor the system um, and use fancy things like Nagios and, and actually collect performance metrics and such. <clears throat> and it, really pains me when I have to work on a 4.1 system that doesn't have these now, because I'm used to them existing. And you can actually, like, it's crazy how much more information it gives you, uh, particularly you know, things like number of pages created per second, number of pages read per second, yeah. buffer pool reads and read requests so you can calculate hit, uh, cache hit rate. 
number of pages of data, number of pages that are dirty, all kinds of good stuff. 5.1, same thing as 5.0, has uh, primarily the big feature in 5.1 is partitioning. Um, if you don't care about MySQL cluster, or there's a lot of MySQL cluster stuff in it, but the big feature is really partitioning. Um, so if you need partitioning, go ahead, use 5.1. There's a lot of other stuff. There's some optimizer enhancements. There's some other stuff that's going in there, but partitioning is the thing. Um, sorry? Logging changes. Yeah, there's a bunch of weird changes to the logging mechanisms. I'm not sure how those are going to pan out. In what regard? Gets slower? <laughs> yeah, to some extent. Well, maybe three to four, it probably got faster. Four to five, it gets slower. Um, and actually, that's one of the things that Google has been doing some research on, that uh, Mark Callahan at Google, actually, um, is performance regressions in five. Now that you have big eyes looking at 5.0, and eventually Yahoo, I guess they're looking at 5.1 eventually. But uh, nonetheless, as bigger users start looking at a release, uh, you'll start to see a lot of new things being fixed. And this is a problem with MySQL currently because their development model doesn't support it. That their development model basically at this point says 5.0 is done, no more fixes. But now Google goes to use 5.0 and all of a sudden they find this huge bug or this huge performance regression, so what do we do with it? You know, do they maintain their own Google patches as they've done with 4.0 or you know, will MySQL accept it and everyone gets the benefits of it or you know, what is going to happen? And so far it's a bit unclear because it hasn't been long enough since Google has been looking at 5.0 and since other big users have been looking at 5.0 and finding those things. And actually, our customers, as we started recommending 5.0, we found a bunch of bugs that we got fixed, a bunch of performance regressions and some, particularly some bugs around escaping of data and replication and really quirky things that there was one, you could look through my bug list, but there was one that was like, uh, it was an interaction between prepared statements, stored procedures, and replication that was not tested. <laughs> and it wrote unescaped data to the binary log, which of course broke replication. Add one function call in some line of code somewhere, and it's fixed, but nonetheless, it still really sucks. So, um, MySQL 6 is what they've been talking about, Falcon stuff. Anyone heard about Falcon? Mm. New storage engine. I've written some things about it, but uh, sort of not an InnoDB replacement, but it works a lot like InnoDB, so please start using it for your InnoDB applications, not an InnoDB replacement, is their official marketing line. Uh, but it's basically a transactional storage engine. It has some interesting features, has some interesting quirks. Um, eventually, it should be interesting. One of the main reasons it's been developed is that uh, it's being developed by MySQL, sort of. Uh, but nonetheless, MySQL owns the code to it, whereas they don't own the code to InnoDB. Uh, and that's been a big sore spot because uh, if, you're, if you missed the news anyway, Oracle bought InnoBase OI uh, in 2005, October 2005, I think. Uh, so two years ago now. And um, so they own InnoDB now, and it's somewhat unclear what they're going to eventually do with it. Um, well, yeah, it's a lot of things unclear. And, um, and MySQL is not very happy about not owning the transactional storage engine. They weren't very happy about it before Oracle owned it, but now they're really unhappy about it. So uh, eventually Falcon might be up to replacing InnoDB, but I don't know. At this point, so many people are invested so deeply in using InnoDB, it's tough to get anything to switch. And everyone has spent years learning the quirks of InnoDB and uh, the exact behaviors of it. And, Um, they can't give everybody grief. They can't give us grief, basically. Uh, what they can do is stop licensing InnoDB, which hurts MySQL's licensing customers. So if you're paying for licenses of MySQL plus InnoDB, some of that money is going to Oracle. But there is an open source branch that... Well, it's GPL'd. So all of the code is GPL. It's available for everyone, but yeah. it can't be re-licensed under a different license. Uh, without Oracle's consent. They were currently consenting that to that, and that may continue forever, but it may not. So uh, it's a big unknown. 
yeah, but they can't hurt the community directly in that, in that sense, other than by not developing NODB, which is another sort of indirect hurt. Um, so if they don't, probably the biggest hurt that's been happening lately is that they won't talk about it. <laughs> so, you know, Oracle's a public company and their policy is to not talk about future releases and whatnot and, and pin down dates for anything. So you can't get any information out of them about when a bug is going to be fixed and when a feature is going to be implemented. It's just can't talk about it. No, can't say. So that, that's really, really lame, actually. So that's hurt the community in a lot of ways just because we don't know what's going on anymore. Not that we knew a lot from Hakey himself because he was really quiet and reserved and you'd have to really ask him if you wanted to know. But now you can really ask him and he won't tell you. So. Was there an opportunity for MySQL to buy NODB? Uh, yes, I guess. I don't, I don't know. I mean, the, I'm not MySQL's CEO, so I couldn't really comment on the exact situation behind that. But my understanding is that he wouldn't sell. Maybe the price price wasn't right or company wasn't right. I don't know. But anyway, he sold to Oracle, and now we're in the situation we're in. So <clears throat> questions, comments, future of stuff. Yeah. Sort of. Uh, so yes, it does support them. They have a pretty big performance impact. X, oh, sorry. For, does MySQL support XA transactions? XA is two-phase commit, basically. The ability to prepare to commit something um, and synchronize commits between multiple machines so that you can be sure that you can execute a transaction across two machines, for instance, and be sure that you don't lose either half of the transaction. And it's, just a, it's actually a general protocol for negotiating two-phase commit. But um, MySQL does support it starting in 5.0. Um, and in fact, starts to support it between storage engines. And that's another area where storage engines are kind of iffy. That um, in order to, one of the main reasons that XA was developed, actually, is that in order to support um, truly transactional transactions that involve more than one storage engine, uh, MySQL has to support XA because it has to do a two-phase commit between the two storage engines and coordinate it that way because they're completely independent databases. They just happen to be on the same machine. The same thing goes for the binary logs and the storage engine. So the logs used for replication and the storage engine itself, MySQL can use XA between those to do a two-phase commit on those. Um, all of that has pretty steep performance impacts because it basically means a lot of extra bookkeeping internally to keep track of the transactions and uh, ensure that they get committed as they should and such. So, um, I, I think one of the key points, actually, with uh, XA, though, is basically XA is just a protocol for negotiating the things. Typically, in any sort of XA-involved system, you have a transaction broker that actually um, manages it. So it doesn't, it's not like you sort of run one command against a MySQL server and it negotiates a two-phase commit across two machines. You have a transaction broker that negotiates the distributed transaction and, and all of that. So there's a really good one in Java, but other than that, I don't know of any. <laughs> um, so that, does that answer your question, I guess? So. Five zero it does support it. Um, a lot of people turn it off for performance reasons. <laughs> there's actually like a, there's a flat option called NODB support XA that you can turn off uh, that gives you some performance boost in five zero. Uh, but yeah, that's the gist of it anyway. Other questions, comments, topics? Actually, so one of the other big features that I didn't mention besides partitioning in 5.1 is row-based replication. So currently, MySQL replication is based on replicating the actual statements uh, across to the other machine and hoping that they execute the same way over there. And it sends across a lot of extra information to try to make sure that they execute the same way, but it's sort of a crapshoot. It's never really possible to make sure that they're exactly identical. Uh, so 5.1 has a new replication protocol, uh, which they're calling row-based replication or change-based replication, that replicates the actual underlying row changes across, which is more typical as far as how databases normally replicate. It has some performance impact and it has some performance advantages, but 
Um, the biggest advantage of it is consistency, that if you get the row-based protocol working properly, you can be sure that it always works properly. The current situation with statement-based replication is that uh, it breaks every other month because someone adds a new feature and they don't think about how it would replicate and then you get five new bugs filed against it and, and literally, and maybe even more often than every other month, maybe every month, something gets broken. Um, and the most recent was a whole spat of changes around um, the insert on duplicate key update command that broke replication in like five or six different ways. Um, yeah. Yeah. So as new, well, as new features are added or bugs are fixed or whatever happens, replication gets broken in the process because they don't fully test how it interacts with replication or what gets stored in the binary log or, you know, whatever. When you deploy your production application and data goes missing on your slave, pretty much. Um, and that's something that, in theory, row-based replication should fix, that provided they do it right, um, and I'm not sure that bootstrapping the current protocol is doing it right, uh, but they, I mean, they basically implemented row-based replication on top of statement-based replications protocol, which it was ugly to start with, uh, with the binary log format and everything. So I'm not sure that it's really going to solve anything, but in theory, it should. In theory, once you get row-based replication working, it, it's much simpler as far as the interface goes because it's implemented in only one place. Um, whereas statement-based replication has to be implemented for every new statement and every variation of every new statement. We're expecting performance to go up or to go down? Depends on the application. If your application is like typical web-based ones that implement or that interact primarily on primary keys, so you touch one or two rows at a time generally, performance will be about the same or better. If your application issues a single update statement that updates five million rows, it's going to be a hell of a lot slower. Because <laughs> you're going to have five million individual row changes logged in the log and passed across and executed individually. Much uglier. One of the upsides, actually, is that statement-based statement replication is almost impossible to parallelize. Uh, but row-based replication is really easy to parallelize because you can apply any number of changes as long as the transaction boundaries match up. It doesn't really matter how many transactions you apply in parallel. Uh, so all you have to do is pick one logical transaction breakpoint and apply everything in parallel and then do a group commit at that point to say, you know, move the database forward in five second increments rather than, uh, you know, statement by statement. So performance go up because you might update that row five or ten times. Uh, that won't actually help necessarily because you, not really. In, in, I mean, it would still have five changes in the log and they would probably all still be applied. So if you update the same row five times within a single transaction, actually, I don't know what happens in that. I think it actually gets written five times. Because it, it's intercepting calls to write to the underlying storage engine. So it's not. No, but I guess they could. I mean, you could theoretically, if it were worth it anyway. I, I don't, I'm not sure it would be worth it. But you could intercept them and sort of mash them together and only send over one copy of the change. But I don't know. What do you mean? Uh, so replication is asynchronous and logged. So on the master, it's logged to a log file. If the slave gets disconnected, it can reconnect and pull down changes that it missed. So you don't have to wait for the remote to... No, no, it's not. It, so that, yeah, there's, there's two basic ways to do replication, synchronous and asynchronous. So in synchronous replication, you wait for the other side to acknowledge an event. And the assumption is that you can't lose data, basically. Um, so you wait for the other side to get the data before you acknowledge it on your side, which ensures that it's in two places already and you can't lose it. Asynchronous replication, you generally write it out to a queue or to a log file. And then the other side pulls that log file asynchronously and executes them as it, as it can. Uh, and there is no assumption or guarantee that the data is there on the other side. Which is another patch, actually, that Google wrote called semi-synchronous replication, which sort of does synchronous replication. It, it ensures that the other side has received the change, but it hasn't necessarily executed it. Yeah? Row-based replication and 
block splits due to extra stuff going into the block. block splits. What's, is the row just for that one record, and there might be a block split or not? That's what do you mean by a block split? Well, I'm inserting a row into a table. Yeah. And it fills up a, a NODB block, forcing a block split in the underlying structure. Yeah. Page split, I think is the Page. term. So, no, uh, the, the event that's passed across is completely storage engine independent, actually. So it's, it's, an un, it's a change, basically just, it's, it's at the level just above the storage engine. So it says, sort of modify this row. Or add this row. Yeah. So basically, and, and you could go into, I could go into a lot of talk about what it, exactly it does, but it basically sends over a before image and an after image of the row. And some of them, some parts of either of them may exist, but the before image at least contains enough information to match which row you're changing. So at very least the primary key. So if you're actually gonna do row-based replication, make sure every table has a primary key. Uh, otherwise things get really ugly. Um, and then the after image is the new columns that have changed. Currently it only sends over the new versions of them. In theory, um, and in practice, actually, it could easily send over copies of the old data as well uh, so that you can do intelligent conflict resolution on the slave side. Um, what about updating indices? Doesn't matter. Well, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it just sends over the change to the row. It doesn't care that it's indexed, so. Yeah. Yeah, in, in the same way that it's basically just a really efficient form of update. So it's, it's a special syntax internally, so it doesn't have all the overhead of parsing the update and all of that stuff, but it's just basically a special form of update. Which is an interesting thing for somebody who does a lot of updates. Maybe they could... You could probably hack it, I guess, and make it work. The thing that replication lacks even in 5.1, though, which I think is a major flaw, why I was saying that they've basically sort of strapped things onto the old protocol, is that it still lacks um, like presence notifications and such so that you can do intelligent coordination amongst slaves and amongst machines. So it's still based on reading a log file without global transaction IDs, uh, no notification, no chattiness available, so the nodes can't communicate with each other in any way. They just connect and stream a log file. And I think that will eventually come back to bite them, that it really needs to be a proper replication protocol uh, with join and leave notifications and message passing between nodes and all of that. It's not all that hard, really. <laughs> the hard part is intercepting all the changes, I think. The, the easy part is, I mean, that's well documented how to do joins and leaves. But just to do the notification and the discussion protocol between them is not that difficult. To actually elect new masters and such is difficult. The communication part of it is easy, basically. The, the intelligence part is not that easy, but the communication is easy. <laughs> yeah, maybe. I'm tempted to actually uh, write, rewrite replication using, what is it, spray? It's the... spray? Spread, that's the one. Yeah. <laughs> Proof of concept. <laughs> <clears throat> It's not perfect, but it's better than the current replication protocol. And you can easily do joins and leaves and message passing and elections and such. But yeah. we'll see. And broadcasts, which you can't currently do. So you could check that the machines actually all have the same clock. They're all in sync with each other. That would be brilliant. <laughs> well, you know, they're all within one second of each other. You don't have one operating on a different time zone. <laughs> How many times has that happened to anybody? Hmm. <laughs> yeah, exactly. This one's in UTC, this one's in Pacific, all my timestamps are completely screwed. Ah, <laughs> uh, it depends. Yeah, that was part of my question. Yeah. Yeah, it's because there's probably no clear answer. <laughs> and to complicate things, MySQL 4.1 has a concept internally of time zones, which also alter the behavior in strange ways, so. Yeah. Other questions, comments, discussion? Let's call it a night, 9 p.m. All right. Thank you all for coming.
and if we are to believe the calendar, the next meeting will be, whoa, that was already November, wasn't it? November 12th. Everyone happy with November 12th? No complaints. No one's a staunch observer of Veterans Day. All right. We'll call it the 12th.